My name is Talmadge Boston. It's my great honor to introduce our speaker today. When the subject comes up to rate those who've been in the business of chronicling the American Civil Rights Movement, there's Taylor Branch at the top of the mountain, and then there's everybody else. And the reason that he's head and shoulders above the rest of the pack is because he writes about history with a personal touch as a storyteller and not as an analyst. Besides being a civil rights historian, Taylor is also a presidential historian, having collaborated on books about Richard Nixon and Bill Clinton. He's also a sports authority, having co-authored a book with basketball legend Bill Russell and written a famous article for the Atlantic Magazine that condemned the NCAA, a perspective that should resonate with at least some SMU Mustang supporters. <laughs> Besides being a top writer, not surprisingly, Taylor is a Renaissance man, particularly in the field of music. He grew up in Atlanta, sang with the Atlanta Boys Choir. In high school, he was in a high school folk trio he then joined an octet that devoted itself entirely to singing spirituals, and he now plays in a band called Off Our Rocker, <laughs> which mainly plays Beatles music, and he also sings every Sunday in his church choir at the Presbyterian Church in Baltimore, where he now lives. Above all, though, Taylor Branch has made his mark in the world as a civil rights historian. In addition to writing his award-winning books, which are listed in your program, he's spoken on Martin Luther King Jr. and the Civil Rights Movement at such prestigious places as Oxford University, Harvard University, and the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. on the occasion of the 40th anniversary of Dr. King's last sermon there. But today is Taylor's lucky day. Today he gets to speak at SMU on the subject, how spiritual faith impacted the civil rights movement. And in the tumultuous world of 2016, where there's so much strife over race in our country and in our world, the organizers of today's luncheon bring Taylor to you because in his words, quote, the king years should serve as a bracing reminder that citizens and leaders can work miracles together, despite every hardship, against great odds. Please welcome as our 2016 Bowlin Family Lecture keynote speaker, Taylor Branch. Well, thank you. I am very happy to be here in Dallas. I want to thank uh, President Turner and Dean Lawrence, and especially you and the sponsors, and Talmadge. Talmadge is a force of nature. I've, I've, I've encountered him before, and I'm very happy that he helped get me back here, and I want to welcome the Lincoln students. Um, in my day, it was called playing hooky, but I'm glad you're here anyway. Um, <clears throat> you... Um, you stretched today in your invocation all the way to an AME minister, but I, I'm here to warn you that I'm going to talk a little bit about what may seem like foreign policy, some Baptists and even some Catholics and Jews. We, we want to reach far out here to talk about the spiritual basis of the civil rights movement because I think it's about, it's about the present and it's about the future in how personal and how spiritual we take the civic challenges and the spiritual challenges that confront the world. So I'm going to be talking about issues as, as significant as our faith, as ultimate reality, uh, and what we want to, how we want to think about it in today's context. Now, to begin with, I want to tell you how I came to the perspective to try to write about these big daunting issues that were, believe me, daunting to me um, in a narrative form whose first rule of craft was don't use labels, try to make the people real. Because where race 
where barriers, to cross barriers, abstract ideas are not as powerful as experience that melts those abstract ideas. How did I get to that? I, I, I just want to tell you a brief story. I, I grew up in Atlanta. My dad was a dry cleaner. Uh, the civil rights movement in the 1950s was terrifying to everybody, uh, including um, most black folks. A good many of the ones who say they were in the middle of it are lying. Um, it, it, it was uh, a daunting event. The only thing I remember it, my dad would take me to Atlanta Crackers baseball games. That was the name of our minor league team. Um, pretty bizarre name, but the name of the Negro League team was the Atlanta Black Crackers, believe it or not. Um, so we would go with some of his employees and we would have to split when we got to the stadium because the employees would have to go sit in the colored section in the 1950s. And my dad on two or three occasions when I was a small boy said to me, I don't like this. And even as an eight or nine year old, I knew that this was a radioactive subject and that I was not to ask him anything. Why, what did he mean? He was not political, he hated politics all his life. He said anybody in politics can't find honest work. Um, and I knew that he was not making a political complaint about segregation. It was something personal that he had wonderful relations and was quite a jokester with a lot of the employees and he didn't like that. But when he said, I don't like that, I knew that this was a topic that I couldn't even um, reach at all. That's how serious it was. In those days, and even in the 1960s, a room like this, I guarantee you, would have everybody's palms clammy with fear. Either that something would happen, or that some incident by the, by the mixture in this room would cause violence, arrest, or at the very least might ruin some the reputations of some businesses for the people here. Every breath you draw is liberated from that kind of clamminess by the witness of that era, and it is a tremendous um, benefit that we carry and don't often appreciate the way we should. I knew over the time of the relentless civil rights era when I was growing up that the, it went very deep. It took it a long time to overcome my fear about getting involved at all. But as it happened, it started, the Brown decision was the year of my first grade, and, and Dr. King was killed my senior year in college, and every year in between, the movement was expanding and growing and confronting. And by the time it was over, it had changed the, the direction of my life's interests against my will. I wanted to know where it came from, what made those little girls march into dogs and fire hoses singing the same Sunday school songs that I sang and not waiting until they were um, really old like I was planning if I might get involved in civil rights when I got really old like 30 um, and and they weren't waiting I wanted to know where it came from and in the summer of 1969 as a graduate student it was it was dissipating and I hadn't really been a part of it a little bit but in the summer uh, of 69 as a graduate student, I went down to register voters for the voter education project in southwest Georgia on, a, on a, a mandate from John Lewis, who's now still in Congress. They had, they had 20 counties in southwest Georgia that were so tiny, black majority counties, that they didn't even have anybody on their Rolodex. They had no contacts, it was foreign. And they said, if you will drive into these counties and spend no more than three days by yourself this summer and, and try to find somebody there that you could recommend is willing and able to administer a voter registration campaign, because even in 1969, these counties had virtually no black registered voters, and they were majority black counties. So I undertook this mission and I tell you that Columbus was not more lost when he sailed west than I was when I went into my first county and drove around looking. My, my only working theory when I started was that I would find the Black Baptist Church and knock on the door and hope I was discovering a new Martin Luther King. That did not work. 
All the Martin Luther Kings threw me out. They said things were very well under control, even though there weren't any voters. Uh, there was a primitive fear in these uh, counties. Even then, I thought I was stepping back a whole century. Uh, it was still absolutely segregated. Um, I tried everything. I went to the educators. I went to the school principals, and they were even more reluctant than the preachers. And the morticians uh, were worse than the school principals. And I went through a phase where I said, no, I need to find the radicals, the people who, who know that the established leaders are not doing anything. So I went through a period where I went out into speakeasies. We called them juke joints, trying to find people that, there who would, who would uh, be interested in registering to vote. And I, I played poker with them, thinking if I took, could take their money, I would win respect. Um, <laughs> That didn't work either. I did get arrested out of a place called Bubba Doo's Big Apple by the, by the sheriff who arrived to take his cut of the, uh, of the beer delivery in a dry county. Um, and for all the illegal things going on in this, in, at Bubba Doo's, the only thing that struck him was me. Uh, he said, you're in the wrong side of town, and he arrested me. Um, so this was a, um, a difficult period of discovery, and after a month, I was where I never dreamed that I would have been when I started, which was that when I got to a new county, I would go out into the fields and try to seek out the women who were working in the fields and ask them, is there anybody in this county that you know of that might be interested in doing voter registration work? And it finally led me in my eighth, sixth or eighth county to the directions. You may know how you get directions in the country. It's not. It's not the conventional way. It's go down, take this, follow this road until you see two dead trees on the right, and don't turn right there, but take the next left and follow it on around up to the top of the hill. And I was um, made my way to a an old woman's house. She was almost a hundred years old. She was what she called 1800s people, 1900s people, and she was the matriarch in this county and. People told me if anybody had the authority to say, do this, it, it was she. So I started trying to explain to her about voter registration and who I was. And she was rocking on the porch and she didn't say a word. Um, she didn't acknowledge her name. She didn't acknowledge me. She didn't say anything for the longest time. And uh, some of you are graduate students and you may know that graduate students, the more nervous they get, uh, the bigger words they try to use to, get, to, <laughs> to dig themselves out. So I was t t explaining to her what a 501c3 tax-exempt organization was that would be administering these grants. And it, after an eternity, she finally said her first words to me, which were, Son, do you really believe that we landed on the moon last night? And as it happened, it was the day after we landed on the moon. In July 1969, I said to her, ma'am, I, I I'm sure we did. I saw it on Walter Cronkite back at the, at the motel on, on television. And she nodded and didn't say anything. So then I started trying to explain some more while I'm trying to figure out her what was going on. And I was explaining to her the importance of voter registration, the importance of Schley County. Georgia has 254, 159 counties, second only to Texas, I think. Um, tiny little county, and it's another eternity went by. She didn't say a word and totally flummoxed me. The second sentence she said was, son, have you ever seen the Simon Eyes Wax commercial? And that really, of course, threw me for a loop, and I'm trying to figure out what is the Simon Eyes Wax commercial, and it, it hit me. I said, you mean the one where the little children float across float across the kitchen floor on an invisible shield of simonized wax and they don't scuff the floor, which was a, a, a prominent television commercial in, the, in those days, and the kids would float across the floor. And she didn't say anything for a while. I'm describing the commercial, and finally she said, do you believe that? And I said, well, I believe they can make it look like the kids are floating across um, the floor, uh, I believe they can make it do, but that is an advertisement, and I saw the moon landing on a news show, and the news show is different from the advertising, and by then, I realized that this woman has me by her throat, by, by my throat, talking to me about the relationship between fear and reality and what's going on, and over the course of the next hour, 
She only said about four or five sentences, but they were all memorable, and I went and I knew in the end, because she told me she could prove we didn't land on the moon, that if we had, all we'd have to do is fill up our tank on the moon, and the next jump we could make it into heaven, and you know God wouldn't let us do that, so we didn't get to the moon, which was her way of saying that she was not that voting in this county went to the marrow of people's bones of survival and that she was not going to put her people in danger on the word of a 22-year-old graduate student who was talking about a 501c3 uh, tax-exempt organization. But I went back to my motel, and as I did all that summer, I was compelled to write down everything she said because it was the language and it was the experience that revealed to me how this went and how I got all the way from looking for Martin Luther King to revering this woman and every word she said. By the end of that summer, my, my diary of such experiences grew to over 400 pages and I turned it in in place of my policy memorandum that I was supposed to give to my uh, graduate professors. Uh, caused something of a stink at, at Princeton. But one of the professors sent it to a magazine that started publishing excerpts and it was the first time I'd ever dreamed so the first thing I ever wrote that got published was the only thing that I'd, I had ever written not on an assignment uh, because I compel was compelled to do it by the strength of that experience. As an aside, I will tell you that at the end of the summer, I only recommended three counties for voter registration. All three of them were headed by women, and all three of the women had came from the same profession, which I never would have dreamed of in a million years uh, when I started. They were all midwives who had a primal authority and an independence in the county because they had been present uh, at life's moments and had the kind of nerve to say, yes, you are coming to meet with this white, this white boy <laughs> because I birthed you and everybody in your family. And um, so they would come. But this, for me, was a lesson about the personal side of race. That was where I learned by stepping through fear and, and engage, trying to engage people personally. And I resolved years later when I undertook took to write about the civil rights era to use no labels. I think they're fool's gold, although we are trained in the Western world to believe that our abstractions and our labels command reality. I think where race relations are involved, we learned uh, when we get thrown off by the Simonized Wax commercial and the lady rocking, and we learned something. So I resolved not to use labels and try to personalize all of my subjects. This led me, by indirect means that I can't get to, to start my book about with Vernon Johns as a way of getting, through, getting at the necessary um, culture of the Black Baptist Church, out of which the movement came, out of which Dr. King certainly came, and he came specifically out of Vernon Johns's church. He was his successor. But Vernon Johns was a vagabond genius uh, that I wrote about. And I want to use one of his sermons because uh, the text to illustrate the personal side of faith that, that animated the civil rights movement. Johns was bold in the early 1950s at, at the height of segregation. He was dared to post on his church bulletin board right at the foot of the Alabama Capitol in Montgomery um, radioactive sermon topics such as it is safe to murder Negroes in Montgomery uh, and when the rapist is white uh, and his classic segregation after death. He posted that um, and of course knowing that there were some people there who, who, nur who nurtured uh, a secret hope that maybe there would be segregation after death, and what the heck is this about? The text for segregation after death comes from Luke, and it is the most commonly used text by Martin Luther King in sermons on a host of topics, including some bodiness and the personal nature of our faith, and also the nature of ecumenicism. Now, um, I wanted to uh, read the, the, the text to you uh, briefly. It, it, um, 
And last night I asked for a Gideon Bible, and, and the hotel here does not have Gideon's Bible. So I, I hope maybe you can take up, take up that issue. Uh, they didn't even have one at the desk, but um, Fran Jackson supplied me with one last night. So I can read you this text from um, Luke 16, the story of Dives and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things, but now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And beside all this, there is, there is fixed between us and you a great chasm in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And the rich man said, then I beg you, father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let, them hear, let, let him hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Dr. King loved this passage. He got it from Vernon Johns. It's not often, that often preached from. It's all from the mouth of Jesus. It's all a story. It's rare if you're not unique in talking about the afterlife, in quoting conversations between heaven and hell, in quoting Abraham, going back and forth. And of course, what Vernon John said, the chasm is segregation. And he said, what is the cause of this chasm? It's not money, because the rich man Dives was a, was a garden variety rich man, but Abraham, who was in heaven, was one of the wealthiest men in all of antiquity. And there he is in heaven talking to, the, talking to the rich man in hell. And he said, it's not that this rich man was particularly bad character. Look what he did. He did two things. He argued with Abraham. He argued with God. The Bible favors people who argue, who argue honestly with God about what's going on. And number two, his first thought after being refused comfort was to think about his relatives, was, was to want to warn them. It was a generous, even sacrificial instinct. Dr. King said he was a liberal. This guy was a liberal. I, if I can't be comforted, I want you to warn my family. What was the cause of the chasm? That even in the torment and, and, and the and the brightness of ultimate revelation, he never saw Lazarus, just as he didn't in life. He said, send Lazarus. He didn't speak to Lazarus. He still thought of him as a servant. Send Lazarus to warn. Send Lazarus to comfort me, to warn my brothers. He never saw him as a human being. He never saw his somebodiness. This is the ultimate sin of separation, that we don't have the courage of our convictions to cross these lines. And Dr. King said, furthermore, listen to the end of this story. He's arguing and arguing, saying, but if somebody comes back from the dead and tells them and warns them, then they'll believe it. And the story ends saying, no, they have the prophets. If they won't listen to the prophets, they won't listen even to someone who comes back from the dead. This from the mouth of Jesus, who is about to be resurrected as the heart of our faith. He's saying that if the message of the prophets, that you don't think of, of strangers, 
as servants doesn't get through from the prophets, then even resurrection is wasted. On it, this, this story burns up all the tensions between Christianity and Judaism, which is one reason that's the ultimate ecumenical sermon topic and may not be spoken of all that often. Now, King loved this story because he felt that it, that it carried the force of all the tension in the Western world about the source of, of grace and justice. We're divided into two major images of what our justice is. One is on our courthouse, which is scales that are in balance, showing that people get their fair portion, and it's almost mathematical, and it doesn't move. The other is the Hebrew conception of justice, which is water, which moves, which is profoundly emotional. Let justice run down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream from, from Amos. And what Dr. King is saying here is we get both of those here in this compulsion to make our faith personal, to reach across the lines that divide us, and to touch people, not with ideas, but with our own witness. And this, of course, is what the Civil Rights Movement uh, taught. A fantastic and powerful witness that is both at the heart of our spiritual faith that we touch people in the, what Jesus was teaching in this parable, but also in our civic faith, that we are all equal citizens and that we are trying to, what Dr. King called, equal souls and equal votes. And the movement, the discipline of the civil rights movement was to have the self-discipline and the public trust to reach across these boundaries even in the face of danger. A freedom rider classically looked in the eyes of somebody, a Klansman, about to hit them and said, Sir, you may hit me, but I have faith that one day, if not from us, our children, it will create a bond that doesn't exist. And most famously, I wish you could have been with me to interview FBI agents who took the first confessions of the Klansmen who lynched Schwerner, Cheney, and Goodman in Mississippi in 1964. They got, when they finally got the first Klansman to confess, he told them the story of how the murder actually happened. And the climax of the story was so fantastic that they didn't believe him. They said, no jury will believe this. And then they got the second Klansman months later, and he said, told the same thing, that they murdered Schwerner first that when the Klansman dragged him out of the car in the middle of the night and took him out into the wilderness and pulled him out and the Klansman put a gun into his chest, that Schwerner said, Sir, I know just how you feel. Those were his last words. And when the second Klansman said he was haunted by the same seven words, these grizzled FBI agents said, This is so amazing that a jury will believe it. That somebody at the last moment on earth is still trying to make human contact, even with the people trying to kill them. That this is the essence of Christian and civic faith in reaching across the lines that divide us. The most powerful person that I knew, I never knew, got to know Michael Schwerner, of course, who embodied this was Diane Nash, a Catholic girl from, from Chicago who embodied nonviolence and who expanded the sit-ins, expanded the freedom rides. It was her idea for Dr. King to send young small boys and girls, mostly girls, into the dogs and fire hoses in Birmingham, which was anathema to black Birmingham. Like people thought he was insane. Um, never except in Passover, perhaps. Have you seen a great power have its political balance tip on the witness of, of children as young as six years old. That was Diane's idea. She pushed Dr. King into doing it. And then after the kids were bombed in, in Birmingham that fall, it was her idea to answer it with the blueprint that became the plan for Selma. She was the ultimate in nonviolent witness. And when I asked her how she looked back on it, she told me that she felt that every day in the movement trying to decide what to do about things like this was like her wedding day. 
And I said, what do you mean, our, your wedding day? And she said, my knees were na- knocking. I knew that in risking jail and in looking in the eyes of people that hated me or didn't see me, that I was taking a leap into the unknown. I was trying to make contact across these divides. I didn't know how it was going to turn out, but I knew it was going to define me. So my knees were shaking. And in that sense, it was like my wedding day. And that's the kind of power that I think helped the civil rights movement become something that in which lasting power grew against the grain of violence, not with him. And that is the lesson that, that she lay down uh, for us and that it, it transformed the whole country through that kind of witness. Now, the personal nature of this faith is connected in the second idea that I want to leave with you in briefer form, is that it's connected to the notion of nonviolence, which is, in theory, at the heart of both our spiritual faith, faith, Christian soldiers, the Beatitudes, resist not enemies, accept, accept the punishment of the cross, knowing that it is not the end, have a faith that we were willing to die but not to kill for. But Dr. King taught that this is also at the heart of our civic faith in the world's pioneer democratic experiment. And why? Because our whole new form of government is based, is a cathedral of votes that run this university and the Little League team and the country and the civil and the Supreme Court and everything else. And what is every vote? A vote is a piece of nonviolence, hard won out of history in our agreement to settle things through nonviolence rather than the sword. And in that sense, Dr. King felt that nonviolence was the essence. And if you ever get a chance to read his Nobel Prize lecture on the December 11, 1964, he said that nonviolence had proven itself a tool to confront mankind's triple scourges of race, racial bigotry, poverty, and war, what she called violence of the flesh and violence of the spirit, and that it was capable of confronting all of these through the power of this movement that I try to describe through Mickey Schwerner and Diane Nash. This is a great paradox for all of us today because we live in a world that in one sense has banished violence. Violence is um, great nations don't do it. Great nations haven't had wars for a long time. Wars are largely confined to poor countries. Um, By historical standards, the, the, the casualties have gone down. Violence is anathema, a sign of illness, if not sickness, everywhere from the streets to the homes, between husbands and wives, between parents and children. There's no more um, powerful consensus than the notion that badness is a symptom of violence, of something wrong in our society. Nonviolence, in a certain sense, has swept the world with surprises. Like, no one expected Nelson Mandela to come out of 27 years of prison and nonviolently transform uh, apartheid in, in South Africa when we had expected Armageddon and we expected an even bigger Armageddon in the Cold War. And what did we get? We got the Berlin Wall coming down with people singing, We Shall Overcome. Democracy has not come to China, but they have not forgotten Tiananmen Square, when, which was modeled on a sit in of nonviolence, trying to show up a powerful witness there that nonviolence really has no place in our world. It's marginalized. And yet, it dominates our culture, our politics, our media. And every movie, Bruce Willis or some star gets bloodier and dirtier until the end of the movie when some spectacular act of violence solves everything. There's no more salient subject in American life than the role of violence all around, and we are consumed with the violence that we do see and magnifying it and making it at the heart of our politics. 
And let me let you in on a secret. Even Diane Nash abandoned nonviolence in 1966. She got sick of it. She couldn't take it anymore. And furthermore, she said, if we've done all this, if we've had Selma, if we've had the Freedom Rides with nonviolence, think how much more we would do if I was willing to knock over a bank and become a gorilla and, and, and do something that was violent because we tend to measure, mean that willingness to commit violence as the ultimate measure of, of potency and commitment. And on... The Meredith March in 1966, when Stokely Carmichael, who had been nonviolent for six years, confronted Dr. King and proclaimed black power with resonating with the threat of violence, they argued all the way down the highway. And Stokely said, Martin, why do we have to be nonviolent in order to get people to do things that they, sh they should have done in the first place. Why do we have to invite more suffering on us to right the injustice that ne never should have been on us in the first place? How come America admires nonviolence only in black people? And otherwise, it admires James Bond and John Wayne. It's not fair. You can't say that. And Dr. King said, you're absolutely right, Stokely. It's not fair. There's no answer to that. You can't tell anybody that they have to be nonviolent. But nonviolence is a leadership doctrine. It is a head of things. That's what has propelled our faith since the cross. It is what has propelled our democracy since we the people, is that we believe that nonviolence is going to create this power. And if we abandon nonviolence, in order to become like white people, we won't be stepping up, we'll be stepping back. Because the fact of the matter is that at that time, nonviolent, the black-led movement was a leadership force recognized by very few for all of American life. And it swept in benefits for people far beyond black people, including the segregated South. Dr. King said it's a wry paradox of history that when Negroes win their freedom, the biggest beneficiaries will be the people in the South who've been upholding segregation. And surely that was true. You never heard of the Sun Belt when we were segregated. You never heard of um, political presidents. The next seven presidents elected from 1964 until Barack Obama, our current one, came from the Sun Belt which had been stigmatized for a century by, by segregation. The movement liberated the white South economically, politically. It liberated women who couldn't even go to major colleges, let alone a place like, once people started struggling with equal citizenship, equal souls, and saw the power of this movement, it has, it has set forth a tide, tidal wave of empirical liberation and equal citizenship that is still affecting our politics. And people don't, women could not serve on juries. There's some lawyers here. Hoyt v. Florida, Supreme Court decision upheld a Florida law that said, yes, women can serve on juries in Florida, but only if they take the initiative to go to the courthouse and sign an affidavit that they want to be considered for jury duty, they will not be offended by language that they hear, and that it will not interfere with their homemaking duties. That is the world that we have come out of. And we what I'm saying is that the civil rights movement and a black-led civil rights movement, in that sense, performed the role of modern founders for all of us, lifting us toward the true meaning of our own professed values. And it is through nonviolent witness that they did this. And yet, neither Luke 16, the story of Lazarus and Dives, gets the attention it deserves, and certainly the relationship between violence and nonviolence and our deepest faith, spiritual and civic, is not the subject of study that it ought to be. There's no more salient subject to young people than the role of violence and heroism and the role of that sort of thing, and yet very few people examine this, examine Dr. King's sermon, examine... Uh, this incredible witness of the power of nonviolence. 
I'm here to tell you that the place I hear it the most is the, is the War College. I've spoken there many times. Professional military people are much more balanced about the relationship between violence and nonviolence in the modern world. And the prevailing opinion there is that since Napoleon, the trend is that organized violence destroys more but governs less. Because you need, in an interdependent world, you need cooperation. You need that to work out. And I want to I want to leave you with some provocative quotations on the nature of, of violence and nonviolence, because it is at the heart of this movement. Dr. King's dear friend Rabbi Abel Heschel said the prophets were the first voice in history to regard a nation's for reliance upon force as evil. They held nations accountable, kings accountable by the way they treated widows and orphans because of the doctrine of equal souls, which, which prefigures the doctrine of equal votes. This is part of the great insight of monotheism, that our, we must subdue our pride and that awe is the beginning of wisdom, which is what Heschel said. And he, he was vastly amused that, that, that the prophets and Judaism, having invented this insight of monotheism, uh, proceeded to wrestle with it. Um, uh, and, and still are. I was at a, at a synagogue in Chicago not long ago, and the, and the rabbi told the story of how he had been uh, praying in the, in, in, on an off day, saying, uh, bless me, Lord, for I am nothing. And that he was carried away in it because he, he thought this was the um, essential discipline of monotheism. And the assistant rabbi came and saw him and was so moved that he started... He started um, praying right along with him, saying the same thing. Bless me, Father, for I am nothing. And then the first female cantor, the Civil Rights Movement, by the way, instigated first female cantors and rabbis in 2,000 years of Judaism. The cantor comes along, sees them praying, and stands on, and gets right in there. Bless me, Father, for I am nothing. And the rabbi looks at the assistant rabbi and says, who is she to say she's nothing? <laughs> this is the wrestling of that insight. A quote from the world of journalism, Christopher Hedges. In the beginning, war looks and feels like love. But unlike love, it gives nothing in return but an ever-deepening dependence, like all narcotics, on the road to self-destruction. It does not affirm, but places upon us greater and greater demands. From the world-class military strategist Martin Van Krevel, it is simply not true that war is solely a means to an end, nor do people necessarily fight in order to attain this objective or that. In fact, the opposite is true. People very often take up one objective or another precisely in order that they may fight. While the usefulness of war as a means for gaining practical ends may well be questioned, its ability to entertain, to inspire, and to fascinate has never been in doubt. War is life written large. In Politics and Philosophy from Hannah Arendt, I took a course from Hannah Arendt when I was at Princeton and got to talk to her about the Simonized Wax Lady, and she uh, awed me then and still does. But he, at a time when the civil rights movement was embracing black power and making nonviolence passe very rapidly, it was the most powerful idea in the movement and the first to become passe and has not dominated uh, or been a large figure in American political discourse about the movement ever since. Hannah Arendt wrote a book about violence and, and said that she wrestled with the philosophical implications of the civil rights movement, confronting the commonplace notion that violence is the ultimate measure of power. Here's what she said. Politically speaking, it is insufficient to say that power and violence are not the same. Power and violence are opposites. Where one rules absolutely, the other is absent. Violence appears where power is in jeopardy, but left to its own course, it ends in power's disappearance. 
This implies that it is not correct to think of the opposite of violence as nonviolence. To speak of nonviolent power is actually redundant. Violence can destroy power. It is utterly incapable of creating it. This is from the world, these are from the world of strategy, philosophy, but from the world of spirit where I want to leave us. We should recognize this too because we get an inspiration from a nonviolent movement but we don't confront its place in our own life where all too often, as Dr. King said, Christians are against every war except the one we're in. From James Carroll's book, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. Without the shedding of blood, the book of Hebrews says, there is no forgiveness of sins. Redemption comes through violence, and this, finally, is what makes violence sacred. And to crawl out of that toward where I hope we can go, he says, Israel's uneven easiness about violence is what generates not only the Bible, but Israel's dynamic and ever-evolving understanding of God. That is why violence is so prominent in the Bible, because violence is the problem it is addressing. And violence in the nature of the divisions between people that keep us from taking those steps that, keep, that make so many people afraid to go downtown, people of goodwill, not to take that step is what still divides us and to some degree paralyzes our inquiry into the role of this faith, civic, democratic faith, and spiritual faith. And I think that's why the movement, to me, is about the future, not about the past. And why when you think about it, the lesson to me is every time there's a Martin Luther King Day, you should think about something I would commend every day, which is not to say this was a good thing for its time or even a good thing for our time, or that we should do something special like serve in a soup kitchen, but that you should, like Diane Nash and Mickey Schwerner, do what the movement did, which is take a step into a place that makes you a little uncomfortable in the spiritual and civic faith, that it will make you grow and that you will learn things that will create new bonds, which in a, a, an ever-shrinking world is the essential path to power, and blessedness, and goodwill. Thank you. Great and timely message for all of us. Taylor, thank you so much. Many of you have gotten his books, and when the luncheon is over, Taylor will be around to sign them if you're interested. Uh, I want to close by thanking the Bolins again for their wonderful sponsorship. This lecture series now has raised over $550,000 for the Perkins School of Theology since it started. So it's a great chance for the community to come together for a great cause. And last but not least, in fact, most important, Thank you, Bill Lawrence, for your 14 years of leadership. Cheers,